So when our kids were little and they'd encounter something disappointing, sometimes they'd throw a tantrum. And you've probably witnessed a tantrum by a two or three year old. For some of you, maybe even this morning. So one minute they're little bundles of joy and wonder and the next minute they're bundles of wrath and sin. And so as a parent, what, what do you do? Well, maybe you try to ignore them and go about you know, buying your groceries as other shoppers stare at you and chuckle. Well, we tried this one thing. We, 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 when something occurred that was disappointing and that might set them off, we tried to teach them to control their emotions and their response, something like this. Oh, you, you fell down and you bumped your knee. That's okay, just get up and keep playing. Or, oh, their, their frost machine is broken, but that's okay, we can get something else. So the, rather than pitching a fit, just chill, little guy you'll be okay. If that's okay, just move on. So it became kind of a catchphrase around our house for a few weeks or months. But we noticed a problem. The problem went like this. Oh, I pushed my brother down, but that's okay. Or, oh, I, I threw my milk on the floor, but that's okay. So you can see the problem. So we had to make some minor parental adjustments on this one. So I read a, a bit of psychobabble from the 1960s, this book here, I'm Okay, You're Okay. In a nutshell, it gives advice uh, that the key to living a healthy and fulfilling life is to accept others and ourselves at face value. I'm okay, you're okay. And maybe this is better than throwing a tantrum. Uh, it does, you know, This advice for I'm okay, you're okay doesn't always work with three-year-olds and it doesn't always work with adults either. You know, um, Yes, officer, I was going 55 in a school zone, but, but that's okay. Everything is not okay. Now, we're in the book of Romans and it is quite broad in its assessment. Chapter 1 says Gentiles are not okay. Chapter 2 says Jews are not okay. Chapter 3 says, everybody is not okay. And there is an answer, and the answer begins in the latter part of chapter 3, but now. And then there's this, this hard contrast between not being okay and what? The righteousness of God, forgiveness, salvation, God's grace, and this is all great news. Well, this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 6. And chapter 6 breaks into the middle of an ongoing discussion. So uh, there's a continuation of the thought from chapter 5. He's right in the middle of chapter uh, this thought from chapter 5, and it's something very important. So I'm going to back up a couple of verses from the previous chapter to the end of chapter 5. So chapter 5, verse 19 says, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And this verse can uh, serve as a good summary of the previous section, the last half of chapter 5. Sin began with one man, Adam, but God's grace and imputed righteousness comes from one man, Jesus Christ. And now it gets very interesting in here in verse 20. Verse 20 reads like this. Now when the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So the law demonstrated and made clear that we're sinners, but then there's grace to meet it. And so if by analogy, if sin were a debt of a million dollars, grace will free us from that debt. But, but note carefully that the grace is not equal to the sin. It says whatever quantity the sin is, grace abounds all the more. Not in an equal amount, but more. And this leads to a rhetorical question in chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1 reads this way. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? First verse of chapter 6. And this is a very logical question to ask. Because don't you want more of God's grace? Well, isn't if so, then isn't sin the answer? And Because if you sin, you'll see more of God's grace. And then we can sing songs about how amazing God's grace is. And it's shown all the more powerful in our sin. And... Yeah, so the thinking might look like this, you know, by analogy, if you've ever worked in customer service, you know that the people only come to you when they have a problem. And your job, that's good, because your job is to fix problems. Well, maybe God's like that. Maybe if people stopped sinning, he wouldn't be fulfilled. He'd be kind of bored. So let's let God's grace be amazing. Well, this isn't a hypothetical issue or hypothetical question, and nor is it unique to Paul's time. But so you can appreciate where this is going. You know, this idea that I'm forgiven 
That's the best news ever, says Paul. Whew, but wait a second. If I'm forgiven, what's preventing me from going out and doing whatever I want? Because, you know, I'm covered. It says right here, it says, where, where uh, sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Old school preachers used to call this fire insurance. I'm going to heaven later, therefore I can live like hell now. This is like the ultimate loophole. Yes, I'm drowning in my own sin. My own sin is literally killing me, but, but that's okay. Hey, I'm okay, you're okay. Thus, Paul's question is, is very uh, important here. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin in, in that grace may abound? Chapter 6, verse 1. It's a great question. Now, it isn't a hypothetical question, but it is a rhetorical question. And what's the difference? Well, a hypothetical question is an imagined one. A rhetorical question presupposes a correct answer. And Paul now gives the answer here in verse 2. And the answer is, by no means. Other translations say, certainly not, or God forbid, or may it never be. But in any case, it's a very emphatic, not okay. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. God forbid. Certainly not. And then he continues by saying this. He's going to give us a reason. He says, how can we, we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6 verse 2. So, for a Christian to continue to wildly sin is a, is a problem. And there's a lot of very good biblical reasons why this is a problem. Uh, the Bible elsewhere says that a tree bears good fruit, and if a tree doesn't have fruit, that's a, that's a problem. And Jesus calls people hypocrites to their face uh, when their actions didn't, didn't match their words. So there's a number of good arguments and thoughts as to why it's a bad idea for Christians to continue in sin. But we're going to focus right here, right now, on what it says here in Romans. And, and why is it not okay? Well, Paul's going to answer this in several ways, and it's going to continue over several chapters. This morning, we're going to focus on the answer he gives here in chapter 6, the first half of it. He begins his, his answer with that question. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So he answers the question with a question. But this question is really a statement. It's like when the teacher asks the students, how are you going to pass the test if you don't study? It's a question technically, but really it's a statement of fact that's kind of disguised as a question. And that's what he ha he's done here. So what Paul is saying is that as a Christian, you are dead to sin. Now, he hasn't explained this yet. He's just asserted it. He's just left it out there. A Christian is dead to sin and thus you can't live in sin. Now, verse 3 is going to start the process of the explanation. Chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Well, in the first three verses, we have four questions. And this one here is also really a statement. Do you not know? Starting in verse 3. Do you not know? And these, in other words, these are things that you should know. And we'll fo focus here on, in, this, in this section here on this word know, which he uses many times in these chapters. What should you know? And the first thing he reminds us about is that we were baptized into Christ and therefore baptized into his death. And that's a strange phrase. When it says baptize into Christ and baptize into his death, that's, that's an odd way of putting it. Well, the word baptize literally means to be dunked or immersed. And so figuratively, when you talk about immersion, figuratively it means to be identified with. And thus, the Bible uses baptism, this word baptism, in many different contexts. It describes being baptized in the, the Spirit, or in other words, immersed in the Spirit. It's, it's a spiritual event. The Bible also talks about being baptized in water or immersed in the water. It's a physical event. And water baptism is, it becomes a, a physical symbol of that spiritual reality. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that the Israelites were spiritually baptized into Moses. They became unified or identified with Moses as they traversed the desert. Jesus says in Luke 12 that he has a baptism ahead of him of pain and distress, meaning he's going to be immersed in suffering. He's going to be baptized into suffering. And now here in Romans, we have this phrase, baptized into Christ and, and into his death. So again, baptism uh, immersed or identified with. A phrase 
in this chapter that this chapter also uses is united with. And this is actually a botanical term, meaning like when plants are grafted together. So this meaning it has to do with grafting together. And water baptism portrays the fact that Christians have been joined with Christ into his death, into the water, and, into, and then up resurrection into life, down to the water, to death, up out of the water, raised in new life. But the immersion in water doesn't change anything. The spiritual reality is what is important. So pause for just a second and dwell in this idea of what it means to be identified or united with Christ. What are the implications? It does have broad implications because it is tempting to think of this whole salvation thing in Christianity coming down to forgiveness. And yes, forgiveness is huge. It's important, but it's not, that's not the whole story. It's more than that. Because it's not just being forgiven and then forgotten. It's, it's being, being forgiven and, and be give, being given a new identity in Christ. We have a new nature in Christ. In Christ, we are dead to sin. In Christ, we are alive to God, immersed in the death and life of Christ, identifying with him. So remember, as we continue on, that baptism or baptize means immersed or identified with. So... This is what Paul says we need to know, introduced by verses 3 and 4. And we're going to read verses 3 and 4 again. And in this second reading, and I want you to notice the tense of the verbs. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 3, it says, have been immersed. It says, were baptized. We were buried. Christ was raised. So uh, these two verses are in past tense. It's a, it's a statement of fact. It's not a command. It doesn't tell them to be baptized into Christ, but it says that they are baptized. Now, the statement at the end of verse 4 is interesting. Because the statement at the verse 4 says, uh, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, it's, this isn't, doesn't appear to be talking about the present. This is uh, talking about the past. This is talking about the present. The resurrection we have in Christ to life is not just a future event. It's now. It's a present event that we too might walk in newness of life. So let's read the next paragraph. And there's a lot to unpack in this one as well, starting in verse 5. Uh, but it's also fairly repetitive for emphasis. So listen in this paragraph, starting in verse 5, to the contrast between life and death. Remember, this is what Paul says we need to know. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that he will, we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over the, him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So first, what about death in this passage? Well, it says when Jesus died, in verse 5, it says that we were united with him in death. Verse 6 says, it says with respect to death, that the old self was crucified. So, the old self, you know, my name is Lauren, and the old Lauren was crucified with Christ. Verse 8 says, we have died with Christ. Sin had to die. So we were dead, previously we were dead in our sins, and now we have died to our sins and set free. And he describes in this paragraph, he says, he talks about being, uh, being enslaved to sin. Our relationship to sin is like that of a slave to a master. Now, here in this last month, I've been reading a, a good book. Uh, it's called 12 Years a Slave. And it was written uh, in the 1840s about slavery at that time. And there's an instance, there are several instances that things get so bad that the author, himself a slave, considers that death is the best alternative. There seems to be no other way out of this existence to one that is a slave. And Paul here kind of agrees. He says, the old you was enslaved to sin and therefore had to die. Now, slavery is a metaphor we're going to hear more about next week in the second half of chapter 6. 
But here, his point about our relationship to sin is that sin had to die just like a slave once dead is no longer a slave. The master, sin, is a complete tyrant. But if you die, he has no control over you. All right, but it's not just about dying to the old master. It's also becoming alive in Christ. So death is one half of it, but coming alive is the other part. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in that resurrection, believers in him also become alive. Verse 5 in this last paragraph says that we are united in his resurrection. Jesus was victorious, and so are we in him. Verse 8 says we also live like him. So baptism in this picture is a great, uh, in this passage is a great picture. It's not just that we're forgiven, that's key and important, but by being united with Christ, we are united in his life. Now, Paul is not saying here that true Christians never sin. He doesn't say, you've died to sin, therefore you don't sin. Instead, there are other commands and imperatives in the text. And so we're going to focus now on verse 11, which I think is really, really key to this. So verse 11 reads this way. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You must consider yourselves. Other translations say count yourself, or I, I actually like the King James a lot here. It says reckon, reckon yourself, reckon yourself dead to sin. It's a command. Reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In other words, you are dead to sin, so reckon yourself as dead to sin. You are alive in Christ Jesus, so reckon yourself as alive in Christ Jesus. So remember that Paul throughout this paragraph has, has said we need to know these things. He uses that word know in, chapter, in verses 3, 6, and 9. These are some things you have to know. But in verse 11, I think he goes further. I know he goes further because this is the only the second imperative or command in the entire book of Romans. Now, the first imperative or command was in chapter 3 when Paul says, let God be true and every man a liar. And that's an imperative because that's something that Paul is saying, you need to acknowledge this truth. Let that be the case, that God is true. Let you acknowledge that God is true. It's an imperative. It's a command to acknowledge that God is true. And here in chapter 6, we have only the second imperative of the entire book. And it's also something that we need to acknowledge to be true. Thus, he says, reckon or consider. And it's not just about knowing or understanding or some kind of comprehension. That's, that's stated in the text. We've got to know these things. That's great. Reckon goes further. It's a faith word, an action word, a command. In other words, believe yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. Knowing a truth is not the same as believing it. So the previous paragraph when Paul says to know, that's not a command. He didn't tell, he didn't tell them to go do things. He didn't tell them to go uh, be baptized in Christ. He says, he informs that, them that you are baptized in Christ. Then in verse 11 comes this command. So you must also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Reckon it as true. Believe it. Act on it. It's a command. And, and this is the case, you know this, so be like this. In other words, grow to be that which you already are. You are dead to sin's reign, so be dead to sin's reign. You are alive to, in Christ, so be alive in Christ. You are a child of the king, so be a child of the king. So Paul does not say right here, he doesn't say, come on, you Christians, don't be so hypocritical, stop sinning. Well, that would be a fair assessment. He could argue that way. Rather, he starts with, know this, reckon this. You have been set free from sin. You have died to it. You have new life. Have faith in that fact. Believe in what is already true. Now, what does it actually mean to be dead to sin? It says we died to sin. Well, this passage does not expect that we're sinless, but rather, like it says in verse 6, that we aren't enslaved to it. Now, since the slave is no longer a master, we're dead to it, we have a choice. And we still do sin at times, but we don't live in it. We don't dwell in it, as it says in verse 2. It doesn't have dominion over us, like it says in verse 9. Look at verse, verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So Christians do still do sin, but sin doesn't have to reign, as it says here in verse 12. 
It's no longer your master to make you obey, like it says here in verse 12. Now, the struggle is very real. It's tr maybe true that I'm a child of the king, but it's not automatic that I behave like one. And to this day, I battle with sin problems, as you, as you do too. Now, God's wrath is on all sin, and Christians are saved from that eternally. But God also wants us to be free from that bondage to sin now. Paul is going to get more into that in the, in the rest of chapter 6 and 7 when he talks about freedom from sin and fighting the temptations of sin in the flesh. For now, he's telling us to know and to believe and to reckon these truths because it's easy to, to get discouraged and, and uh, confused. I don't know if you've seen ads or maybe experienced this, some of these new virtual, rea virtual reality headsets that people put on. They put this contraption over their eyes with uh, computer generated images and, and they look very real because suddenly you think you're on the edge of a cliff and you're about ready to die, but you know, it's only an illusion. The reality is quite different, but it sure looks and feels like it. And I think the Bible is very clear that the devil is like that. He says, you are not saved by faith. That's ridiculous, says the devil, because he says, look around you, you sinned again today. You aren't free from anything. You're still a slave to sin. And Paul says to first know the truth. Then to reckon the truth or count to the truth. And then, and then to what? Fight sin. Let's read on verse 12. He says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for, for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. So when we, were, when we were pagans, we had no choice but to break God's law continually. We had to obey sin. It was our master. We had none other. It reigned over us. But now we have a choice. And this paragraph here, starting verse 12, has more imperatives. And it's not, well, you better be sinless or else. It's let not sin reign. So we are not free from all sin, but we are free from the guilt of sin. We're free from the reign of sin. And we're free from the dominion of sin. And there's a very real sense in which the Christian life is, can be characterized by already, but not yet. We are already forgiven. We have already been shown grace. We are already dead to sin. We are already a child of the King, but we are not perfected. We have not arrived. Our life is still bound up in this mortal flesh. Let me quote a very similar statement from Philippians chapter three on this topic. This is, a, this is a good summary of what we just talked about. In Philippians chapter 3, it says this, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I'm not perfect, but Christ Jesus has made me his own. So let's look. One, we'll discuss one last time the past versus the present. In the past, I was a slave to sin. I was unable to do otherwise, and everything was simply not okay. Now, in the present, I'm not perfect, not even close. And I never will be this side of glory, but I'm also not a slave to sin. I'm not under its dominion or its authority. In the present or in the future, I've been freed from that old man, and I belong to Christ, present and future. Christ came to save you and me from the eternal consequence of sin, but also to save you from your sin now. He came not only to save you and redeem your future, but also redeem your present. So in Romans, what we have is we have this tension between these two propositions. On the one hand, sin is, sin is terrible to the extreme. On the other hand, God is forgiving to the extreme. And critics will say that Christianity is both too demanding and too forgiving at the same time. The Bible is way too picky about what sin is. And also, it's, the Bible is way too free about letting people off the hook. Thus, without God, a Christless culture tries to get rid of these things. It tries to say that, well, sin isn't that bad, and even if it were, there is no God that can extend His grace. We're all in it alone. You know, this last year, 2020, has been very painful, but it's also done Christianity some favors in some respect. It's, it's destroyed the illusion held by many that mankind is basically good. The reality is that sin is a cancer that destroys people. Sin destroys people. It destroys families. It destroys communities. It destroys nations. This whole notion that I'm okay, you're okay. Mankind is intrinsically good? Uh, no, it's not. 
Now what, now, what needs to happen is hearts and minds need to be open to the solution of the problem, which is only found in Jesus Christ. Because God's grace can deal with sin. His grace is sufficient for, for me and you. But that doesn't mean that Christians should stay enslaved to sin. It's not okay. And the answer is to start with what we know and believe. Verse 11, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd fill us with the truth we need. We pray you'd give us faith to believe your promises and give us the humility to know our weaknesses. And we ask you for the strength to resist temptation. We praise these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.